My name is Lon Sapko, co-author of the John Wiley and Sons, The Social Media Bible, the largest book ever written on the subject of social media. Today we are here with Evo Tara, co-author of Podcasting for Dummies, also published by John Wiley and Sons, and we'll be speaking about audio and podcasting. So let's get started. Uh, so Evo, please uh, tell our listeners a little bit about your background and why you r- co-authored the book Podcasting for Dummies. Sure thing, Lon. Thanks, by the way, for uh, inviting me here uh, on the show and to give some knowledge back out to the uh, readers of the book and listeners to the show if it comes out, too. So the reason I wrote Podcasting for Dummies is that I am one of the old men of podcasting because I'd been doing my audio podcast since um, October the 14th, 2004. And according to the one directory we had at the time, Podcast Alley, I had the 40th podcast on the planet. Wow. So that means I got in at the ground floor with lots of other really smart people at the ground floor. But I was fortunate enough to have as one of my uh, connections a, a fellow author who had written a lot of fiction books who had an agent who heard about podcasting and said, can you write this book? Well, he knew he could write a book, but he knew he couldn't write a book about podcasting, but he knew me. <laughs> and so together, his name was T. Morris, by the way, we hashed out the necessary plans to get together and, uh, and craft uh, the, the, the most basic podcasting how-to book, Podcasting for Dummies, which I'm happy to say is about to go into its second edition, and all updated new content. Congratulations. And it is the most popular, number one selling how-to uh, dummy you know, podcasting book uh, on the market. Wow, congratulations. That's totally cool. Thanks. Jeez, wow. we got a, we got a star here. This is cool. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the first question that everybody seems to ask when we talk about technical subjects is, what insights have you learned um, from your, uh, your, your background in, in doing podcasting? What tips would you give to the beginner? How do they start? Well, there's a lot of information out there about starting a podcast, and um, the the most common uh, word that's given out there is just start and figure it out as you go along. And that's and that's not bad advice for some hobbyist that just wants to play in the media, but for business people and for people that really want to get in and make a splash, you know, I, I suggest they take a different route. I, I didn't start podcasting was not my first introduction to audio production. Um, I've done what we took an internet radio show in 2002 that I was co-hosting and turned that into a uh, terrestrial syndicated radio show, mm. which also managed to get XM satellite syndication back in 2003. Wow. So my audio experience is a little longer than just simply podcasting. And that's enabled me to, to take a look at this new, oh, this new milieu, if you will, and say, you know, your audience might be looking for something a little different than what a podcaster is, is thinking about right away. And the very first thing I would suggest people do that are interested in this is do your homework. You know, find out if there are other people in the space that you're getting into. Most business people are not going to say, oh, I'll open up an ice cream stand without having at least some understanding of the ice cream market. You, get, you have to know what you're getting yourself into. Even if you have no idea how to, how to run an ice cream stand, you can at least find out what the business is. The same thing goes for podcasting. You can figure out what the competition, if you want to think about it as competition, I don't. I use the word because we all understand it. But if you at least understand what, what is competing for people's time, uh, inside of the, the type of topic you would like to discuss inside of your podcast, but also other sorts of media that are doing the same thing, just not in a podcast form, whether that's you know, radio or whether it's an, an audio book. You know, understand what your listeners are likely to want to. Do your diligence. That, that, I hear two really uh, good points in there. And, and, of course, the first one is, is to get out there and do a little bit of research and understand what's going on before you actually st- start doing it. And then the second thing I heard was, is again, kind of like the sports shoe slogan, just do it. Yeah. Okay. That, that's exactly right. You know, ju- just do it is, is a fine way to go through and do there. And but you know, just do it with a little bit of understanding of what, what the modic- marketplace looks like. That's great. That's really good advice. Of course. And the second question always is: is that uh, especially for the beginners, what do they need to kind of watch out for? What are the misconceptions? What kind of pitfalls? Uh, how, what are the warnings? 
Well, you know, they're legion. I could go on for days on, on, on what not to do, uh, as, as I'm often reminded myself. You know, there's no one right way to do things, but there's lots of wrong ways uh, to do things. And there's, there's lots of tips and advice books out there that'll, that'll give you some suggestions. But one of the things that I think I would, I would caution people about is that since we're talking about this user-generated content of podcasting, amateur-level people are getting into the space who haven't had a lot of experience uh, using the tools. Um, there's a lot of people out there who are advising that it's the content that's the most important, and I don't disagree with them. Mm-hmm. Content is king. You have to have something that's worth talking about that is interesting to people. However, I think that oftentimes comes uh, at the expense of quality. And in fact, I've heard more than one person suggest that you ought to not worry about the quality of the show because it's content that matters and, and, and other reasons of why, why the quality is not important. And I, and I just I have to disagree. Um, and I have to disagree for one reason. I know how easy it is to make your podcast sound professional. The tools that are out there today that everybody has access to, you don't need a $50,000 microphone and studio setup to make yourself sound fantastic. You don't need to go out and buy $6,000 pieces of software so that you can edit things properly. You can do it all with the basic tools, and the only thing you have to invest to make your podcast sound better than it does today is time. Mm -hmm. Whether that's an extra 30 minutes or two hours, that's up to you. But there reaches a point where you, you could go back to that document or that, that, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that uh, audio file you've recorded, and you can make it better. You can do the tips and tricks to actually improve the quality so that while you've got stellar content, you've also got stellar quality, and it just makes it so easy for new people to adopt what you're saying uh, into their normal, everyday life. Could you mention a couple of the tools that we talked about when we got together last? Yeah, sure. The, the, there's there's a quite a few tools out there. I recommend anybody starting out new in podcasting that, that they don't go out and spend crazy amounts of dollars. In fact, you spend as little as possible. Uh, download Audacity. Mm-hmm. It is a, a free software uh, audio recording program that works on both PCs and Macintosh systems. Amazing. And it is what I would estimate probably 50% of the podcasters still use today. I still use Audacity. Mm-hmm. It's free and it's simple and it does just about everything you're going to want to do at your level. Now, if you're an audio engineer, it's a different situation. You want to use your different tool set from that, yeah. but Audacity is wonderful. Um, let's see. That's your number one tool to do most of your work. There's another piece of tool, uh, equipment that I like to use called the Levelator, mm-hmm. and it's some free software that you run your spoken word audio through, and it magically and I don't mind using the word because I've seen this tool work and I use it every day myself, it magically brings up your audio levels to a fantastic level. It's not a perfect tool. There are plenty of engineers who don't like to use it, but my recommendation to all new people and all podcasters today is if you're not using the levelator and you don't have a good excuse why you're not using the levelator, then you really should be using the levelator. It's amazing what it can actually do to your sound. Those are pretty good tools. And again, uh, the wonderful thing about social media is almost everything is completely completely free and the only investment that you really have to make is time. That's exactly right. A base recording of you, maybe a partner, um, you know, you, you can get away with that with, with little or no investment. Definitely for an individual podcaster, it's really simple. Now, there are some specialty tools which come into play if you want to record telephone conversations or maybe you want to buy a, a, a library of, of, of pre-licensed music so that you don't sound like everybody else is grabbing the free stuff. There are those investments to make, but if it's your first time doing it, don't. Mm -hmm. Don't invest any additional money. Your computer already has set up what probably what you need to do to get started. Even with a cheap five dollar microphone that it came with, I know many people who started out that way who once they figured out what they wanted to do, eventually graduated to to bigger and better equipment. But start off with spending next to nothing. And the other point that you made in there was really awesome, and I didn't even realize it. Actually, you corrected me uh, the last time that we were together, and that is um, most people are under the impression that social media productions, whether it's podcasting or video, uh, needs to have that homebrew feel to it. Otherwise, it's implied that there's a corporate sponsor hiding some kind of a corporate message. And maybe that was true early on, but I think you're absolutely right. I agree that uh, you you, people are also getting to a level of sophistication that they're expecting a certain quality, even in the homebrew versions. 
That's very true. You know, quality has become important even though people don't recognize it and realize it. I think what's becoming more easily to discern from the podcast listeners as they have matured over the last four years is the issue of authenticity. Mm. And I think you may be right. Early on in the process, if something sounded really slick and polished, you started wondering, what's the underlying yeah. agenda? What corporate underwriting sponsorship has happened here? But I think consumers are becoming a lot more educated than that now. They're a little more sophisticated, and they're able to really get down to the message. You don't need – if your goal is to try and sound like the guy who does the 10 o'clock news, that's going to fail miserably. Mm-hmm. You know why? That's a terrible delivery. They have to do that in a certain way because they've got a certain amount of time to get people before you get to bed and yeah. drag you along. That's why they put the web that are at the end, you know, you don't have to do that kind of stuff. But what you should be doing is going through with a tool like Audacity, cutting out the ums and the ahs and the really long dead space and the place where your cell phone rang and the dogs barked in the background. There's no reason not to stop, back up, and just make that sound better. Don't sound fake. Be authentic, but make it sound great. That's really great advice. And again, with the tools that you just described, there's no reason why you can't make it sound professional. Very true. Very true. The uh, one other question that always comes up is, uh, again, based on your experience, what success stories can you share with us to inspire the beginner podcaster uh, that has kind of a business slant? In- sure, I, I've, I've got a few stories. The majority of my experience in podcasting for the last few years um, has been with uh, podcast authors. I started a website called podiobooks.com, mixing audiobooks and podcasting together. And over the last three, almost four years now, we've managed to grow to like 235 titles, I believe, that today, which are you know, audiobooks that are either complete or in the process of being completed that are released out in serialized form. Um, and my biggest success story, a friend of mine inside of that, was named name of Scott Sigler. And Scott was an author um, on a part-time basis. Many of us find ourselves to be uh, authors in, the, in, their, in their off season. I luckily uh, have no desire to write fiction, which is great because I have no gift for plot. So that's a good thing for me. But for many people, it's a burning desire to, to write fiction and they want to be the great American novelist. Well, that describes Scott Sigler, you know, in his all the way growing up. And he wrote a couple of books uh, in the 90s and the 2000s and really had a tough time getting some people interested in them. The book industry, that the publishing industry is, um, has developed over the last Oh, couple centuries, a, a process by which they allow certain things to come through and get rid of the other ones. There's nothing wrong with gatekeepers, but sometimes you find yourself on the other side of that gate and you just simply can't break in. Mm-hmm. Well, that's where Scott found himself. So in early 2005, he made the decision to start releasing his book as a podcast. He was one of the very first authors to do so and slowly grew his audience. And with the idea of, I want to become a successful published author. Well, let's fast forward to about a year ago. Scott nailed a publishing contract with Crown Publishing, one of the largest ones, their division of Random House, wow. one of the largest publishers on the planet, for a deal that not only just let Scott you know, quit his day job to eke out a living, but quit his day job to live extremely comfortably while he writes these next three novels. He did it by using podcasting to get out into the market and to grow an audience and to prove to a big company like Crown Publishing that he was the real deal, that his people would actually flock to his stuff and buy his stuff if it was put out. It's a a great success story. But he didn't do it just with podcasting. That's one of the misconceptions. I have a lot of other Mm -hmm. authors who say, well, then I'll just release my book once a week, uh, one uh, one chapter of my book every week, and I'll get successful too, right? (laughs) Not at all. Scott is doggedly tiring or tireless on his relentlessness as he goes through the social media sphere and connects with his audience. He's constantly on Twitter sending out updates. He's got email notifications list. His Facebook page is, is ridiculous the number of followers that he has. He keeps his website maintained you know, three, four times a day. He's putting up web posts. He's really working the total sphere of the new media to really um, energize his troops behind him that got him to that success level. That's what's required. It's not a, not a one-quick fix thing. See, and that's another really good point that you bring up. I mean, you, you do have to do the p- podcast. You do have to have a certain level of quality, and you have to have good content. But yeah. probably more important is uh, getting out there, is building your social networks, u- utilizing all the tools in social media to build a following. 
Yeah, that's very true. I know of very few people who've had success by doing just one thing. Um, if anything, people have had success because they had a fantastic, an amazing, you know, experience that they were delivering in podcast form, and then their fans pretty much drugged them, kicking and screaming into other <laughs> aspects of of the new media, and that's when their careers were started to take off. And that that's really required. So if the, if the thought is I just want to do this one thing and and be done with it, that's okay. But understand it's not going to be as great of a success as it could be if you really worked all of the different angles and started energizing your user base where your user base wants to be. That's incredible advice, hence the need for something like the Social Media Bible. And not that that's a blatant plug, which it is, but that's one of the things that I noticed when I started getting involved in social media is that really it's kind of pulling it all together and building that trusted network and building that following to accomplish anything you're setting out to do. That's right. And so lastly, um, is there anything else that you'd like to tell our listeners about your experiences with podcasting that you think might be helpful? You bet. How about if I give you a few more things to watch out for? Yeah, please. Ask some tactical advice. Well, I, I focus a lot on strategies now, but people who are just starting out, their strategy is to start a podcast. So let's get to some tactics for a quick second right. here. Um, the very first thing I'll suggest that you do, new podcaster, is as you might be asking yourself, how long should my podcast be? Pretty common question. I flip that on its head when people ask it to me, and I say, how short? Can you make it? Mm -hmm. Because if you arbitrarily pick a time, I'm going to make a 40-minute long podcast. You'll find yourself filling, putting in stuff that doesn't need to be there when you could have said all you need to say in about 10 minutes. Good point. And honestly, I don't know of anybody who's ever unsubscribed to a podcast because it was too short, but I can tell you hundreds of times I personally have unsubscribed to podcasts because they're too long. Good point. Shorter, sweeter is better because there's lots of stuff out there. Bite-sized content's better. Doesn't always work, but if you can, keep it nice and short. Um, second thing, when you're doing your editing of your show, not necessarily when you're recording it, although it's how I do it, but when you're editing your show, please use headphones. If at all possible, go buy a good quality pair of headphones. But editing with headphones is imperative because it gives you a nice isolated sound and so you can catch everything that's going on inside of it. Ultimately, people just edit with the speakers on their computer or through a monitor system. That's not how most people listen. Most people listen to podcasts with their headphones or their earbuds plugged inside of their ears. Mm -hmm. I know I do, and I do it a lot of times when I'm driving or I'm commuting somewhere. Mm -hmm. And once you start figuring this out, the little nice subtleties of, of, of audio changes you put in there are going to be completely lost when somebody's on a subway trying to listen to what you have to say or driving down the road with their car tops open. So make sure it's nice and loud, but definitely edit it with your headphones on. Final piece of advice, Lon. Yeah. Validation. <clears throat> Not personal validation to make sure you're all good <laughs> fine, yeah. but validate your content. All too many people think, all I've got to do is get an MP3 file, stick it through something like FeedBurner, and everything is fine and good. It's not. If you're going to go through the effort and truly wanting to grab an audience, then you owe it to yourself to make sure that your MP3 file itself is perfect all the way through, that all of your ID3 tagging, that's something that describes the MP3 files to people's podcatchers and uh, audio players on their site, make sure those are filled out and you understand why you're filling things out that way. And the most important piece of that is for your RSS feed, that which distributes your audio file out to the masses who have subscribed to you, you have to make sure that that is perfectly validated. There's free tools out there. Feedvalidator.org is one of them. Drop your feed in. Make sure that there's no problem. Because you may have the best product out there and wonder why nobody's listening. Maybe it's because they don't know what it is, or they can't find it, or it breaks their podcatcher iTunes when they plug it inside of there. That's a really good point, because the first time I podcasted, I generated all these different podcasts, and I started getting emails from people saying that they couldn't listen to it on their iPod, they couldn't transfer it in, and yep. it pretty much rendered it useless. Yeah. That's a really yeah, good that's a lot of effort to go through to have somebody go, you know, I, I can't listen. So, you know, that back in the, in the wild, wild west times of Oath War, we figured all this stuff out. It's readily available information on exactly how you should encode, exactly how you should tag, and exactly what the format of your XML RSS feed should be. Follow those directions to the letter. And some of that information is in Podcasting for Dummies? You bet it is. Ha-ha, that's what I like. <laughs> One-stop shop. 
This Evo, thank you so very much for being here today and sharing those tips. Uh, every time I talk to you, I learn something new. I really appreciate it. I tried to help, Lon. Thanks for having me on. Uh, that's totally cool. Um, I'd really like to thank you again, Evo, um, author of Podcasting for Dummies uh, by John Wiley and Sons, and for being here today and sharing those valuable insights with us all. This has been Lon Safko, the co-author of the Social Media Bible. Be sure to check out other valuable social media tactics, tools, and strategies that can be found at the Social Media Bible book and the companion website, www.thesocialmediabible.com. More information about me, Lon Safko, or learn how I can speak at your company or your next event, please visit my website at www.lonsafco.com. And again, Evo, thank you, and thank everyone for being with us here today.